good. Hey. Justin, what am I doing here? <laughs> Should we get started? We're, we're, as typical, we're on grace time today, and uh, there'll still be people that will still come, you know, wander in, which is awesome. Uh, we, we love that about our church. Anyway, um, I've got a couple of announcements for us this morning. So uh, on June 29th, mark your calendar, we're going to, we signed up as a church to uh, serve dinner for uh, Northwest Arkansas Circles. So if you, if you don't know anything about Northwest Arkansas Circles, uh, it's a group uh, that's been formed and they come alongside people and actually, you know, help them, help lift them out of poverty, help them grow their skills and things like that. It's a great group. We've done it one time before. So uh, check with uh, Teresa on that one, I think, um, or Stacy. And uh, that'll be a, a good time for us to get together and serve the community. Um, by the way, Teresa's uh, email address is thecornets at gmail.com. It's on your announcements. Um, also, uh, we still need volunteers to help out with different things in the morning. Thank you, Sean, for always bringing the communion table. You know, thank you, Justin and Jennifer, for doing sound this morning. Thanks to you guys for coming in early and singing and playing and stuff. So. But all of that stuff, uh, you know, we, we need people to help with that. So if you uh, have any of those talents and or any of those interests, uh, check in with Stacy, um, and she'll help guide you into that service. Um, other than that, I'm th am I missing anything, you guys? Is there anything else going on? Did anybody go to the Gully Park concert series Thursday night? I did. That was fun. Was that fun? Yeah, you yeah, you went to no, it's good good times. Um, it's sort of an informal thing that we've decided. Hey, it's there, it's free. We like free. You know, we're going to try to do that uh, as often as possible. So, um, well, if there aren't any other announcements, let's uh, let's take a little time as a group this morning to um, yeah, just to get our hearts in trim. You know, to kind of get our minds and spirits aligned with His Spirit this morning. Um, Maybe a w way I'll do that is I, I want to read, um, if, if you've never read any of Fred Pratt Green's stuff, he always is, just has such a rich theology to his poetry. So I'm going to start off this morning, I'm going to just give us a time of peace and quiet. We're just going to rest in that, and then I'm going to read this poem from Fred, and then we'll, we'll join together, we'll stand and join together in, in saying the Lord's Prayer. So just relax and, and just rest your mind. Just take a deep breath or two. When our confidence is shaken in beliefs we thought secure, when the spirit in its sickness seeks our sick seeks but cannot find a cure, God is active in the tensions of a faith not yet mature. Solar systems void of meaning freeze the spirit into stone. Always our researches lead us to the ultimate unknown. Faith must die or come full circle to its source in God alone. In the discipline of praying when it's hardest to believe, in the drudgery of caring when it's not enough to grieve, faith maturing learns acceptance of the insights we receive. God is love and thus redeems us in the Christ we crucify. This is God's eternal answer to the, word, the world's eternal why. May we in this faith maturing be content to live and die. Let's stand. Our Father, who's in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sinned against us. And lead us not in temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever.
praise your name among the nations. Praise your name with all my heart. Join my voice with all creation. Can you pray for who you are? Let's sing that again. Praise your name among the nations. Praise your name with all my heart. Join my voice with all creation, giving you praise for who you are. And the rocks will not cry out before me, and I will never sing your praise. Blessings you have poured out on me, and everything. Everything more. I praise your name among the nations. I praise your name with all my heart. Join my voice with all creation. Give me praise for who you are. And the rocks will not cry out before me. I will ever sing your praise. Blessings you have poured out on me. And everything, Lord, you give me. Everything and more. Hallelujah. Light shines, the light shines in the darkness, in the darkness, and the darkness cannot over. And the darkness cannot over. Oh, the light shines, oh, the light shines in the darkness, in the darkness, and the darkness cannot over. And the darkness cannot over. Behold, behold, His kingdom now is come. For the valley, oh, the valley will, be lifted, will be lifted, and the mountains will be brought down. And oh, the mountains will be brought down. Oh, oh the valley, oh, the valley will be lifted, will be lifted, and the mountains will be brought down. And the mountains will be brought down. Oh, behold, behold, His kingdom now is come. Behold, behold, his kingdom now is come. Hear the voice. 
voice cry from the highway. Make way for the prince of peace. Won't you make way for the prince of peace? Hear the voice cry from the highway. Make way for the prince of peace. Won't you make way for the prince of peace? Behold, behold, his kingdom now is come. Behold, behold, his kingdom now is come. God justice, God justice, righteous judge, righteous judge. Behold, 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 our defender, our defender, Prince of Peace, Prince of Peace. Behold. Behold, 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 struggle in the water, struggle in the water, and marching through. Behold, behold, his kingdom now has come. Oh, behold, behold, his kingdom now. sound good this morning. You guys have a seat. I'm going to invite my sweet friend Laura up here and she's going to talk about failure. Am I on? There we go. Yeah, today's all about failure. So good news. Happy news. <laughs> Real positive, positive way to, to start. Um, like Alex said, my name is Laura Holland. I'm the member, a member of the teaching team here at Grace. So welcome to everyone who is here, to everyone watching on Facebook, and to anyone listening on the podcast. We are glad and grateful for each and every one of you. So let's talk about failure. I finally finished all of the intake paperwork and the training sessions and the pre-work, everything that was required for me to start my new job. Not just a job, a career. And like most people, I was newly entering the workforce, and so I was really excited about the change that I was going to make and, like, how my perspective was going to really, like, move the needle. It was going to be a really big deal that I was going to bring in. I was really hopeful, and I wanted to make a positive impact. So really, in short, being someone who's a recovering perfectionist, who has a tendency, tendency towards some positivity, both for myself and others, I was on the precipice of something new that was really exciting. And then I entered my office space for the first time. And what I saw was this huge bulletin board that was covered in headstones. Basically think like elementary school bulletin board, but a little bit macabre. So this is weird, but I'm still excited. And so I get a little closer and I realize that it's titled Project Graveyard. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it was an artistic monument to products, briefs, ideas, different things that had been stopped mid-process. So literally the first thing I saw when I walked excitedly into my new job was a celebration of failure. And I soon realized that this was actually pretty common there. There was one team that would hang up their heavily edited papers as a reminder that they just needed to keep going. I even went to a bake sale once where the winning baker had a graveyard themed cake and she had meticulously piped names of different products onto these cookies that were then stuck in the cake to look like tombstones. This was a cultural thing. And honestly, it was amazing to be part of an organization that recognized that failure was part of the process. And they didn't just recognize that it was part of the process, they reveled in it. It did take a little bit of getting used to, and when it was my product or idea that was being hung up on the product graveyard bulletin board, I needed some help. I didn't love it, but once I did embrace it, it was freeing. It was really freeing because the focus was on the trying, 
the focus was on getting out there and attempting something, not on success. Success was really nice, still love success, but that is not where the primary focus was. This office was teaching me how to walk through failure, how to have a mindset that accepted it, a blueprint for it, just how to approach it. I didn't realize it at the time, but it really was setting me up for success outside of those walls. This is a really good thing because that career lasted less than a decade. But what was really interesting is that it's actually a fairly accurate model of how Jesus tells us to walk through and acknowledge and accept failure. We don't spend a lot of time talking about failure in the church. Back in the day when I had perused Christian bookstores, there really weren't a lot of signs or shirts celebrating failure. Tim had a really vast collection of those shirts back in the day, and I confirmed with him, and he doesn't remember those either. So I was curious to see if anything had changed. So I went to a couple of Christian bookseller websites and, um, and typed in failure. That was my search term. And the top results that came back were books about being fearless, books about believing, and books about avoiding failure, specifically in your job, parenting, marriage, or dieting. There was like a whole category of those. But I want to be really clear that this isn't a Christian thing. Culturally, we do not like talking about failure. There is a growing subset that um, has kind of embraced this but it's small, it's still a subset. Largely, we don't like it if it's ours. We love other people's failures. I don't know if anyone else has really gotten into Floor is Lava, but my family and I have been binging it. <laughs> yeah, Charlie's dancing. We've been binging it. My kids love the slow-mo replays when someone misses their jump, like right before they descend into like the bubbling lava. They love that. American Idol spends a lot of airtime on the people that aren't gonna make it through. Even sports highlights spend more time talking about, maybe not more time, but they do highlight missed catches, fumbles, interceptions. And when I Googled failure, almost every result had the term epic right next to it. So we don't want just failure, we want big failure. That tracks. So I've already alluded to it, but surely there is another option beyond avoiding or ignoring the inevitable and mocking others who have the guts to even try. And I'm not talking about a middle ground here, and I don't think that's what Jesus is advocating for either. So as we'll see in our reading this week in Mark 6, Jesus doesn't personally avoid situations where failure is possible. He doesn't ignore the chance of it for his disciples, and he certainly doesn't mock them. Instead, he provides a framework for response that I submit is worth us considering for ourselves today. So, Mark 6, 1 through 13. Now, Jesus left that place. That place is across the Lake of Galilee where he had just raised Jairus' daughter from the dead for a little context. So he left that place and came to his hometown, which is Nazareth, and his disciples followed him. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. Many who heard him were astonished, saying, where did he get these ideas and what is that wisdom that has been given to him? What are these miracles that are done through his hands? Isn't he the carpenter, the son of Mary and brother of James, Hoses, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? And so they took offense at him. Then Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own house. He was not able to do a miracle there, except to lay his hands on a few sick people and heal them. And he was amazed because of their unbelief. Then he went around among the villages and taught. Jesus called the twelve and began to send them out two by two. He gave them authority over the unclean spirits. He instructed them to take nothing for the journey except a staff, no bread, no bag, 
no money in their belts, and to put on sandals, but not to wear two tunics. He said to them, whenever you enter a house, stay there until you leave the area. If a place will not welcome you or listen to you as you go out from there, shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. So they went out and preached that all should repent. They cast out many demons and anointed many sick people with olive oil and healed them. So my daughter Charlie, in kindergarten this year, learned some of the basics about how to talk about different elements that make up a story. So if we were to chart the highs and the lows in this story that we just read, we would basically have a mountain range. You know, it's just up and then down, up and then down. And if we're to look at the themes, we have vulnerability, effort, rejection, failure, and then perseverance. So big picture, we're shown that rejection after putting ourselves out there can lead to grieving. We learn that failure is part of trying and that perseverance, defined as steadfastness in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success, is part of the game. So last week, John discussed the story from Mark 4, where Jesus calms the storm in which the di disciples are afraid. Jesus then rebukes the disciples, saying, do you still not have faith? John unpacked it that the disciples' fear was not what was being addressed in that rebuke, but the fact that the disciples still aren't seeing Jesus for who Jesus is. Today's story is kind of like an act two of um, really driving this idea home because here we see that Jesus has returned to his hometown to people who knew him, but they cannot see now who Jesus is. So in other words, their ideas about him are fixed. So they don't have a category for what they're seeing him do now. The people think they know who Jesus is. So they end up getting it wrong. Tim's family motto growing up is, it's not wrong, just different. Those in the synagogue with Jesus appear to be working with the motto, it's wrong because it's different. Different than what we expect. Different than what we're used to. Different than what you typically do. Different enough that I have to make a split second decision to either adjust my perspective or to choose to double down on what I've always known, which can lead to fear or offense or othering the person who was brazen enough to make me question these things. So we see the shift in the response to Jesus between verse two and verse three. So we go from many who heard him were astonished, asking where did he get these ideas, where did this wisdom come from and the miracles, Statements and observations that, depending on the tone with which we read them, can be anything from admiring, maybe shock, maybe even confusion. In the message version, Eugene Peterson translates it as, he made a real hit, impressing everyone. We had no idea he was this good. So regardless of the tone that we ascribe, the point is right now, it's more observational. They are just seeing what Jesus is doing. But those observations lead them to either question what they thought they knew or to reject the truth of what they're seeing in front of them now. They go full throttle into rejection. Isn't this the carpenter? Could be read as who does he think he is? And maybe with like an added dose of dude's just a carpenter. Why is he going around pretending like he's been taught by some great rabbi? His dad was a carpenter? He's a carpenter. Why is he acting above his station? A station that in this time, mind you, would have been established and settled at the time of his birth. And referring to him as the son of Mary isn't like a sweet reference to the divinity surrounding his birth. No, no, it's like a double jab. One, they're not referring to him using the patriarchal lineage that would typically be used to refer to someone like this. And they might have been subtly talking about the unorthodox nature of his birth. So, either way, it's not meant to be kind. This is not a welcoming environment. 
and so they took offense to him. When they had the opportunity to choose between reconsidering, allowing Jesus to show them who he actually is, or staying stuck in their preconceived notions, insisting that they tell Jesus who he is, they choose to be offended when he is not fitting into the box that they've made for him. Going back to Eugene Peterson, he phrases it, they tripped over what little they knew about him and fell sprawling, and they never got any further. And that imagery is so good and so relatable. Because I'd imagine if we let ourselves, we can think back to a time when we tripped over the little that we knew of somebody and chose to respond with offense instead of getting back up and trying again, this time with maybe a little bit more curiosity. In our teaching team meeting this week, John really dug into the idea that Jesus in this story and this experience has come back to those who he knows and presumably loves. These are his family members and his neighbors. Putting ourselves into that situation, how might you feel? Because Jesus has made a point to go back and to tell them this good news. He's someone that they should know and should trust, but they don't. And we go on to read that he wasn't able to perform miracles there, the understanding being that he couldn't because of their lack of belief. If anyone's going to root for the hometown kid, shouldn't it be them? But it's not, and they didn't, and the disciples were there to witness it. So I want to be clear now that I'm moving into some spiritual imagination, so I'm not suggesting that this is gospel, but I've brought friends to my hometown before, so I can imagine Jesus hyping up his hometown to the disciples, telling about his friends and his family, and maybe even letting them in on some of those backstories from like the quirky neighbor, just things that only locals would know. So then he goes to teach at the synagogue, and it's a big flop. He goes to perform miracles, and there is such little belief in him and what he's doing there are some minor healings, but nothing to write home about, not that they'd care. If Jesus received a performance review of his work in Nazareth, it's not too pretty. His efforts failed. And by some review standards, that would mean that he failed. Because we tend to conflate failing with being a failure, even though they are not at all the same thing. And like we have probably experienced many times, the failure wasn't because of Jesus' own doing, but it was because of the response of others. He did everything right, and it still went wrong. As I was preparing for this and talking to, to Tim about it, he mentioned that, nuance aside, that it was shocking to think about Jesus failing because he had always kind of unconsciously connected failing with sin but we know that Jesus was sinless. So if we use our mathematical principles, we can deduce that failing isn't inherently sinful, and we're not bad or wrong for failing. Ironically, we have a family value fail big with the idea that we want our kids and us to try new things that scare us, try new things we are not already good at with a focus on the experience, not the outcome. But even with that positive spin on it that we do take, Tim realized, listening to this, that he was conditioned to think of failure as wrong and therefore sinful. This might be where some of you are too, so I think it's important to pay attention how Jesus responded. We read, he was amazed because of their unbelief. He acknowledged one what went wrong, and where the point of failure was, their unbelief. And then he had an emotional reaction to it. He responded. And then we're told that he went around among the villages and he taught. He spent some time dumbfounded, and then he continued on his way. He continued his good work. It didn't stop because of an off experience. Jesus didn't ignore or sugarcoat the failure or disappointment either. But 
he didn't stop. And not only did he not stop and stay there, he also sent his disciples out to continue the work. I love what Kenneth Bailey wrote in his book, Jesus Through Middle Eastern Eyes, when talking about this. He refers to Jesus sending the disciples out here as the first mission trip. So he sent the disciples out on a mission trip, and the only instructions that he gives are to take only what they need. And this was intended to ensure that they went in need of the people to whom they traveled. Now, as I was reading about this, it made me think about the way that we typically discuss tithes and offerings and giving here at Grace. We will talk about the fact that, in part, these are a reminder that we all have something to give and that we all have need. It is highlighting this reciprocal relationship of needing and giving and of caring for one another. And so the disciples had something to give to those that they were visiting, but traveling with little meant that they were reliant on the hosts for their needs. John mentioned that it's likely that the instruction to travel without a bag was directly in reference to the typical practice of the day where religious travelers would bring a bag that was meant essentially to take an offering as payment for what they provided. That in part was um, Laura paraphrase for that historical fact. But basically, they would take a bag so that they could be paid for what they were doing. So that's a transactional relationship where the one traveling had the upper hand and is the opposite of what Jesus was instructing. Here's the thing, though. <laughs> this reciprocal relationship that Jesus was talking about, it's scary because it requires us to be vulnerable, which means that we might get hurt. And that's where Jesus' instructions to the disciples on how to respond when people didn't welcome them or listen to them comes into play. Jesus didn't pretend that it wouldn't happen, nor did he send them out without preparation. He told them to shake the dust off their feet and move on. And we're told that they did, that because of that, many were healed. There were demons cast out and people were anointed. Okay. So I feel like now is maybe an appropriate time to admit to you guys that for years, when referencing Jesus's instructions to the disciple to shake the dust off their feet, that I'd instead use the phrase, brush the dirt off their shoulders. So it wasn't until preparing for this weekend that it hit me that I've been conflating the rapper Jay-Z's and Jesus's instructions um, and have been doing so for decades. And I really wish that I were kidding about any of this. But <laughs> um, and Tim was like, I thought you were just making jokes this whole time. No, 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 no. I was just confused. But when Jay-Z tells his listeners to go and brush your shoulders off, he, among other things that aren't really super appropriate to discuss in this venue, was encouraging them to brush off the negativity of others. And it was a way of showing that they were in control of the situation. But what did Jesus mean? So in preparation for this week, I read um, a lot of interpretations of what Jesus might have meant with the encouragement to shake the dust off their feet. Okay, so this isn't an all-inclusive list, but a few of the thoughts are, one, that Jesus and Jay-Z might actually have been talking about the same thing, that there might have been an element of just shaking the dust and brushing the dirt to just rid, themselves, rid yourself of neg negativity. Like you're just moving on, you're ridding yourself of this. Another compared it to the phrase, I'm gonna wash my hands of this. So you're done, you're just done. The message translates this verse as shrug your shoulders and be on your way. It's just kind of like a bummer. Taking into account the customs of the day, we learn that when, or when Jews are leaving Gentile cities, that they often shook the dust from their feet to demonstrate their separation from Gentile practices. So they're leaving it all, even the dust behind. If the disciples were to practice this when leaving a Jewish town, the suggestion then is that they felt the need to show their separation from the Jews who rejected Jesus. It was a display that they were set apart and they wanted no trace of the place on them that had rejected Jesus. 
One suggestion that I thought was interesting kind of builds on this last thought, and that it could also be a reference to the typical Jewish expression of grieving, where mourners would mark it by throwing dust on their head. So dust thrown on your head eventually will make its way to your feet. And so shaking the dust off, therefore, could be acknowledging that the time of grieving has been observed and is now past. So it's time to move on. This might seem like an obvious statement, but I don't want us to miss it. Instruction to move on from an observance of grief would necessitate having observed the grief. In other words, acknowledging the emotional response to being disbelieved or ignored. So whether we're removing negativity, shrugging our shoulders, demonstrating disgust, or grieving, we're acknowledging what happened. Unlike the encouragement from the book titles that I mentioned earlier, Jesus' instructions require that we not avoid or ignore or just try to solve and fix before it happens, disappointment, or failure. Instead, we spend time before we move on to the next step. Well, the next step is moving on. But moving on without this acknowledgement can feel false. It can feel shallow. It can sometimes even feel like we're lying to ourselves and others if we don't take that time. But hanging on in that space can make us feel stuck. We must eventually move on. But we cannot skip over the fact that Jesus sent the disciples out two by two. He sent them out in community. So while the failure response of acknowledge and move on can be experienced solo, that wasn't what Jesus was setting up here. He provided support. He provided fellow travelers. And he provided encouragers for when the shaking it off step was too hard or when the moving on felt impossible. So just as Jesus knew to prepare his disciples for what to do when they were rejected, sending them out in pairs suggests to me Jesus's awareness that even with simple, clear instructions, it would be hard. Because simple doesn't mean easy, and this blueprint is not time-bound. This scripture doesn't boil down to get over it, but instead, I see you, I feel you, I've been there, and I'm with you now. So here's the good news. We will all fail. Yay, we'll all fail. Failure is really a guarantee if you try anything. But failure isn't bad or wrong or sinful. So there's no need to attach guilt or shame to it. It's often just part of the process. And when we do fail, we can feel what we need to feel. We can respond how we need to respond. And leaning on our community as we do so, we can move on. After we brush the dirt off our shoulders, we move knowing that God has been with us the entire time. So if the worship team wants to come up and those that are um, handing out communion, we're going to move into a time of reflection, a time this is also where we give, either online or in the box at the front, and remembering that this is honoring the reciprocal relationship that we have of meeting and giving with each other. So as we prepare for communion, and we'll just work our way up, serve yourself, take it as you get it. Let us remember that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, on the night that he was failed by his friend, he sat first with his disciples and shared a meal. During that meal, he took the bread and broke it, took the wine and poured it, and told his friends that the elements of the meal represented his body and his sacrifice, broken like we are today. And to remember him each time they ate and drank. So as we're gathered today, may we remember as we do the same.
the fire the broken in the spaces in between you'll hear my voice cry out to those who need only if you're listening whatever find me with the ones without a voice, forgotten and before. My blessing is on those who love the poor. You opened up the door. What is I want to know you, Lord, like I know a friend. I want to know you, Lord. I want to know you, Lord, like I know a friend. I want to know you, Lord. I'm laying down. All my religion, I'm laying down. I want to know you, Lord. I'm laying down. All my religion, I'm laying down. I want to know you, Lord. But I'm laying down. I want to know you, Lord. I used to think that I could box you in. But I'm laying down. I want 
want to know you, Lord. I'm laying down all my religion. I'm laying down. I want to know you, Lord. I'm laying down all my religion. I'm laying down. I want to know you, Lord. Lord, I've been told to be ashamed. Lord, I've been told I don't measure up. Lord, I've been told I'm not good enough, but you're here with me. I'm laying down all my religion. I'm laying down. I want to know you, Lord. I'm laying down. All my religion, I'm laying down. I want to know you, Lord. I want to know you, Lord. I reach out and you find me. They say no amount of untruths can separate us. I reach out and you find me in the dust. They say no amount of untruths can separate us. I will rejoice in the simple gospel. I will rejoice in you, Lord. I will rejoice in the simple I will rejoice in you, Lord. Oh, Lord. To follow Jesus, I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning. Past behind the 
cross before me, my past behind me. The cross before me, my past behind me. No turning back, no turning back. Oh, oh. Grace Church, blessed are we when we strip away all the extra, when we see the world as it really is, broken, tender, fragile, and beautiful. These are the same eyes that see God in everything, too. Blessed are we who walk the hard road, the winding one that doesn't opt for the shortcut of rage or resentment or unkind words that doesn't pave over with trite niceties, but walks toward peacemaking. Blessed are we when facing hardships of all sorts. Blessed are we working to usher in God's kingdom of love even when it's hard. Blessed are we, the imperfect, and don't have it all together. God's beloved. Amen. Uh, the show is over now. Yeah. <laughs>